Me too. Black Lives Matter. Occupy Wall Street. We understand these movements at an intellectual level, but I wouldn't talk about our emotional understanding of them. The feelings they stir in us that we are reluctant to admit. Sure, we may feel sadness, anger, pain, but we also may feel helplessness, defensiveness, denial, fear of being the bad guy, fear of not knowing what to do. Who do I mean when I say we? I mean we who have privilege. Urban Dictionary defines privilege as the sweet end of the inequality stick. <laughs> some of us have lucked into more privilege than others, but almost all of us have some privilege relative to others. And you don't have to be a straight white man to have privilege. Put simply, if you heard about movements like these and thought, that doesn't affect me, then you have privilege relative to the people who are affected by those movements. I'm not here to blame anyone for being dealt an ace in the poker game of life. But the thing about privilege is that having it usually means we don't have to think about it. It's like breathing. We don't realize that our experience is a function of privilege until we hear someone else say, I can't breathe. Whether we know it or not, some of the discomfort we may feel around these types of movements is a result of our privilege being shoved in our faces. One of the first times I became aware of my own privilege, I was 20. Approaching a college bar that let in pretty much any student, regardless of how fake their ID. I was with two fellow students, one white, one black. My white friend and I easily got into the bar. Our black friend was turned away. But not because his ID was fake. Because they saw the color of his skin, and they didn't believe he was a student. Standing there in the cold, I didn't know how to say to my friend, I see you, and I see what is happening to you. So I said nothing. I went into the bar, and he went home alone. In that moment, I felt powerless, as I imagine many of you have felt powerless to make a difference in issues that are so large and pervasive. We feel unqualified to make meaningful change. We think of activism as someone else's job. But we are all invited to be activists, beginning the moment our privilege is reflected back to us and we don't like what we see. I never considered myself an activist. I thought that being one would mean restructuring my entire life in the pursuit of justice. I pictured revolutionaries leading people through the streets. And that is activism. But activism can take so many forms. The start of my activism looked like creating a podcast to learn more about social inequity. Later, I attended trainings on reproductive rights, grassroots organizing, LGBTQ justice. I started volunteering on a political campaign. And now, I'm quitting my marketing career to pursue a master's of public health. I'm not saying this is the path you should take to activism. I'm saying I didn't become an activist overnight. I'm hesitant to call myself one now. But I made an effort to understand my privilege and then reckon with the uncomfortable emotions that came up as a result of that. The emotions like denial, defensiveness, helplessness that came up for me that night outside the bar. And by dealing with those emotions related to my privilege, I could then use my privilege to make small, seemingly unrevolutionary changes in my life. Until one day I woke up and looked around and thought, this looks a lot like activism. 
No one has the perfect prescription for what your activist starter kit will look like. But here are five things I've learned along the way that we can do or notice when we don't do every day. One, defer. Defer to marginalized people when making decisions that will impact them. If you don't have a uterus, defer to people who do have uteruses when making decisions about what they can do with their uteruses. Two, call out inequality when we see it. Whether with our friends, family, or colleagues, if we are not discussing the toxicity of inequality, we are contributing to a culture of inequality. Three, make room at the table for those whose lives don't look like ours. Especially when it's a literal table. There's a term for all male panels. They're called mantles. Don't be caught near one. <laughs> Four, own our mistakes. We will make them because culturally ingrained biases don't reverse themselves overnight. I regret the mistake I made that night outside the bar. And I learned from it. And five, respect. Respect that marginalized people don't owe us, the people on the sweet end of the inequality stick, anything. They don't owe it to us to explain their oppression to us. We can go to the library for that. They don't owe it to us to assuage our guilt. We can go to a therapist for that. And they don't owe it to us to come up with the solutions to their own oppression. We have to look inside of ourselves for that. These are just five things, and maybe they seem small. But what if we didn't wait to think about our own privilege until the next time a trans woman comes forward about her assault? Until the next time a Muslim is attacked on a bus in the suburbs? Until the next time an unarmed black man is shot? What if we all started by noticing the little manifestations of our privilege swirling all around us, and then using that privilege to disrupt the status quo? Thinking back to that night outside the bar, I probably couldn't have called out the bouncer. Given that fake ID in hand, I was committing a felony, it wasn't the best time to get on my high horse. But what if my activism that night had looked like validating the painfulness of my friend's experience? What if it had looked like walking home with him? What if, by all of us incorporating these seemingly unrevolutionary actions into our daily lives, at our local bar, at our Starbucks down the street, we actually help to fuel the revolution? We all have a role to play as activists. Are you ready to start playing yours? Thank you.